You know, Satan's workers make a claim against God's people when they have the advantage. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a program that takes you through the Bible in one year, and we love doing that. And on today's program, we are going to study something interesting. The Satan's workers make a claim against God's people when they have the advantage. What is that claim? Well, we'll talk about it. It changes, and we'll speak about that coming up in just a moment in our teaching segment. Right now, Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Today, we are exploring the time in history when Sennacherib of Assyria attacked Jerusalem. Really? Sennacherib attacked Jerusalem after he attacked all those cities in Judah? That's fascinating. Okay, so here we go. What mm -hmm. did you study today? Who is the Rabshakeh that we're talking about in Isaiah chapter 36? The Reb Sheka. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so here we go. We're going to study. Get your Bible out, get your Bible guide out, and get ready because Corey is coming to bring us history and archaeology as we begin our study and our journey through the Bible. Stay there as we continue. Isaiah chapter 36 describes a time that no doubt would have been very traumatic for King Hezekiah of Judah, whose palace and royal residence was in the city of Jerusalem. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, destroys many Judean cities and besieges Jerusalem. The Bible records the military campaign that King Sennacherib of Assyria carried out against Judah. Sennacherib's invasion of Judah, destruction of Lachish, and the besieging of Jerusalem that traps King Hezekiah inside. The Bible is not the only document to record these events. There have been four clay cylinders and three clay prisms found buried in the foundation of Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh. He had them written less than a year after his conquest of Judah, and then buried for future generations to uncover. The prisms end with a request from Sennacherib. In future days, when this palace grows old and falls into ruins, may some future prince repair its ruined parts. May he take notice of my name. Sennacherib's effort to secure a lasting name has had pleasant side effects for us today. The rest of the text is stunning. It records, Hezekiah of Judah would not bow down to me. Forty-six of his strongholds, all walled cities, as well as innumerable smaller towns in his territory, were taken. My men brought up siege engines, raised them to the ground with battering rams, attacked and took them by storm. The king himself was holed up in his royal city, caught like a bird in a cage. The glory of my greatness overwhelmed Hezekiah in his terror. In the end, he had to submit to my yoke and pay me tribute. What Sennacherib does not say is important. Sennacherib never claims to have destroyed Jerusalem. In fact, he has his palace walls decorated with scenes of destruction from Judah's number two city, Lachish. The Bible and Sennacherib agree. The land of Judah was devastated, Hezekiah humiliated, but Jerusalem was not lost. 
Now, the book of Isaiah in chapter 36, where it talks about the invasion of the Assyrians um, under the kingship of Sennacherib of Assyria, it is one of three biblical texts that speak about this event. But it is one of four uh, bodies of evidence that we have. These Assyrian uh, prisms of Sennacherib, there are multiples, but they all say the same thing. They, they describe this very same event. So we have this corroboration of this history that it really did happen. Now, that's important because it would be very difficult to prove just on the archaeology of Jerusalem itself and Judah itself that something like this happened, simply because this area of land has been occupied consistently Consistently since before the time period of Sennacherib's invasion. So a destruction definitely would be found, but buildings were still built up on top of that. So it's very difficult to establish uh, something like this, even though there have been a lot of leaps and bounds made in this area. Nevertheless, I digress here, so let's move forward. Uh, when we're looking at the invasion of Sennacherib and when we're looking at the life of Hezekiah, seeing that this would have been extremely traumatic for Hezekiah, uh, it still, Sennacherib still was forced to leave Jerusalem intact, which meant that Judah still had its freedom. Jerusalem was its capital city. So Hezekiah and his sons would begin to rebuild Judah. Sennacherib's actions are shocking and remarkable. He destroys all the cities of Judah and he levels their fields. He tears down their gods and overruns their worship places. He then makes his way to Jerusalem, where Hezekiah exhibits his strength. One of the leading men is Rab Shaketh, the man who stands by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to Fuller's Field. He tells the people under King Hezekiah's rule that the waiting is over. Hezekiah should give up and surrender. Now, the way Rabshakeh conducts himself reveals his ignorance. This is a sign of the great battle that never happened, but which Jerusalem won. Wise guys understand the meaning of this. Isaiah 36, verses 1 through 13. Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you two thousand horses, if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen. Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. 
Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rebshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rebshakeh said, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rebshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 13. Isaiah is amazing. He talks to the present, he speaks to the future, he speaks to the past, and he speaks to everybody as if they're in one time. That's a prophetic voice of God. And he speaks today by telling a story that's fascinating. And this is a story about Jerusalem, a story about Hezekiah and his kingdom and what takes place. And as we begin this story, I want to tell you that the Bible Guide is conducting a very special study here. And you can get the four points plus many other things if you write to us and ask for the Bible Guide. It's very important. But as we study today, we need to pay attention and look carefully at exactly what Isaiah says. Now, this is our review. Our review is wisdom in the battle. Our reading is Isaiah chapter 36 to 37. Now, if you read that, you will keep up with us in the Bible. It is very exciting as we complete the Bible. Now, our focus is on Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 to 13. We are not going to cover all of them. But we're going to cover most of those that bring the three points from this scripture that we need to understand. What is God saying? And why is God telling us this today? And this is important as we study the scripture. So we go into the scripture and we see in Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 to 3, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah. And he took them. And then the king of Assyria sent Rabshaketh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to Fuller's Field. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Jonah, or Joah, the of Asaph, the recorder, came out to meet him. Now this is amazing because here we have an example of people who are meeting together. Satan's workers always make a claim against God's people when they have the advantage, but we must come to God. Now this is interesting. They came out to the Fuller's field, to the entrance there, and to talk to Rab Shaketh, and he tells them, you might as well give up. You might as well just stop it because you're all going to die anyway. And he begins to say this in the local Hebrew tongue there. And people on the wall and people who are nearby begin to hear this. And Rab Shaken knows exactly what he's doing. He's psyching the people out. Now remember, they had canceled and wiped out all of the cities around Jerusalem. And this is something that's very important because those cities were failing. And they come to Jerusalem. This is the one city. And they say, give up, give up. That's what he says. Now we must come to God here instead of giving up, come to Jesus Christ. We come back to the scripture. Then Rabshaketh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this which you have, which you trust? I say to you, speak of having, I say to you, speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, he will go into his hand and pierce it. So Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to all who trust him, this will be. Now this is interesting because he makes the assumption and Satan's workers always say, God's people trust in foolish things. We must understand the lies they speak. Now, it's true that he says that if you trust in Egypt, you're trusting in foolish things. That's true. 
But the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, did not trust in Egypt. They were trusting in God. And they were trusting in King Hezekiah, who would eventually go and pray to God in his temple for what this is going to mean. Now, this is very interesting because Hezekiah decides that there's no way he can win this. And the only way to really bring this out properly is to go to God and say, God, here they are. I mean, we are, we have no choice. We have nothing, but I'm not going to give up. I, I mean, here we are, God. And that's exactly what Hezekiah did. Now, that's important as we move on to the next point, because the next point says, but if you say to me, Rabshakeh says, we trust in the Lord our God. Is it not he whose high places, whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. Now, therefore, I urge you, give pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel the captain of the least of my master's servants and put on your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it, Rabshaketh says. Rabshaketh continues, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now this is absolutely fascinating. Satan's workers say the Lord has given them permission to destroy us. But God is our refuge and our strength. Now, this is so important. He says, uh, come on now. You really believe that the Lord your God is the one who's protecting you? I'm telling you that the Lord your God is the one who told me that uh, I took all this place. And then he says something fatal. He says, besides, you know, Hezekiah took down the altars and all of that, and that's the Lord your God's. No, it wasn't. He took down the idols and the altars for false gods. And Hezekiah was making the people of Jerusalem worship the one true Lord. And so here we see that the people who are demeaned and the people who think that they have the power don't really have the power. And that is very important for us to understand at this time in this particular part of the year for Canada and the United States for their elections. We need to keep in mind that God will do what God will do. And the church needs to get on its knees and get on its face before God and pray and ask God to move in a special way. And the Lord will do it. Isaiah chapter 37 documents that Sennacherib king of Assyria was murdered by two of his own sons. The Assyrian records verify this and the Bible names Esarhaddon son of Sennacherib as the next king. Let's look at his records. The Bible tells us the fate of brutal King Sennacherib. One day, while worshiping in the temple of his god, his sons struck him down with the sword and escaped to the land of Ararat. Then his son Esarhaddon became king in his place. The Bible's history is echoed in King Esarhaddon's own records. He recalls, Disloyal thoughts inspired my brothers. They rebelled. They killed Sennacherib. They fled to an unknown land. Esarhaddon had inherited Assyria. His first project was damage control. His father had ravaged the city of Babylon. Esarhaddon wanted to gain back the people's favor and support. So he rebuilt the city and with a hands-on approach, restored their religious shrines. His records say, I myself picked up the first basket of earth, raised it to my head and carried it. Esarhaddon claimed the religious right to be the king of Assyria and Babylon. Next on his plate was the rebelliously toxic nation of Egypt. Esarhaddon marched against and defeated the Cushite pharaoh of Egypt, Terhaka, who is named in the Bible as helping King Hezekiah rebel. Esarhaddon has a large carved stone set up. 
On it, he boasts, I tore the root of Cush out of Egypt so that not one of the Cushite dynasty remained there. A solemn warning to all rebels. The picture carved into this stella deserves attention. There is a very large Esarhaddon standing with Terhaka and another conquered king hooked through the lips and tied to a rope that Esarhaddon holds. This image is what the Bible says happened to Manasseh, king of Judah. Manasseh, who was Hezekiah's son, is even mentioned in Esarhaddon's own records. Four blood moons, what are they? Do they hold any prophetic significance as some claim? Or are they some sort of harbinger to signal the end of the world as we know it? Are these the cosmic signs prophesied about in the Bible more than 2,000 years ago? Or is this just another repeat of Y2K or 2012? Join Ryan Hembry as he seeks to answer these questions and uncover the truth behind these cosmic events in this full-length Cosmic Mystery Special. To order your copy of the Cosmic Mysteries Blood Moon Special, simply send a gift of $25 or more to Quick Study Television. If you live in the United States of America, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, or call at 724-733-8336. If you live in Canada or anywhere else in the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2 or call us at 519-940-8338. Don't delay, get your copy today. Thank you for staying with us as we continue through the Bible here on Quick Study Television. It is a great program as we focus on the Word of God. The Word of God is relevant today. Here's what we're going to talk about next time on Quick Study Television. God speaks to us so that we gather our strength to appeal to Him. What am I talking about? We'll talk about that tomorrow. We're going to get into it. It's going to be fun. You're going to love it. And God is doing something really (laughs) interesting. Now... Janice has come up with some ideas here today with what we're studying. Right. Well, we are looking at Isaiah. Our total reading was 36 through 37, but I'm going to focus in on chapter 36 of Isaiah about this person that we're introduced to in verse 2. It says, Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And you wonder, well, who is this person? Well, that is actually an Assyrian title, meaning chief cupbearer. Now, to you and I, that might not sound like a very important job, but it was. This person would have been very highly valued and very highly trusted by the king. So the position may have started for him like a butler, but developed into a very highly influential post. Now, this man, the Rabshakeh, would speak for the Assyrian king much like an ambassador. So that would be understandable then for us to realize that he would be most treasured and trusted by the king that sent him. Other cupbearers that we've heard about in the scriptures, um, there was a chief butler in the story of Joseph, if you'll remember, when Joseph uh, was in prison and uh, the chief cupbearer was down there as well as the butler. And Nehemiah, I think he's probably the most famous of the cupbearers, at least that I know. Um, And he was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes. And you can read about that in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. Nehemiah was an interesting person Mm -hmm. because he was the governor of, he was Jewish. Yes. And he was the cupbearer for the king. Yes. And he came in and he was hearing that, Jerusalem was not in good shape. Mm-hmm. And so he realized what he had to do. He had to be sad yes. in front of the king. Well, to be sad in front of the king, that could have killed him. Ex- that, that was illegal. Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you That know, was an illegal move. Yeah, it yes. was. And I mean, the, 
it's it's all very front and the center. The consequence could I have mean, been death. You know, and so yes. anyway, he goes in and he's sad before the king. And the king says to him, I see something's wrong with you. What is wrong with you? Now the queen's sitting next to him, okay? So that's mm -hmm. double double power. Double trouble. And he says, well, you know, it's just that my city is in shambles and the walls are messed up and yeah. torn down and and uh, the king says, well, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, with your permission, I would like to go back and supervise that. Yeah. Now, that was something highly unusual. Very much. And it's important for us, before we get into it, before we really understand it, we've already been through it, but it's important for us to realize the difference or the change, if you would, of a cupbearer leaving the king mm -hmm. to go somewhere else to do something totally separate from his empire. And uh, it is an amazing, stunning display. So, you know, when you read Nehemiah, and you should read it again sometime, <laughs> understand the, the power of this thing. And a lot of people don't. They just think Ezra, you know, Ezra is the greatest, and they don't pay attention to Nehemiah. But you should pay attention well, to Nehemiah. Well, you know, we have titles, man-made titles for people and very high-regarded high positions. But when God puts you in a place and he has an assignment for you, he will move heaven and earth to make that possible. Yeah, he does. He moves heaven and earth and he moves everything and you just go with it. But it's for people of faith, people who love the Lord and commit to him. In this confrontation, understanding the details surrounding the words of Satan is critical. God has spoken to us, and we must remember. Satan and his workers are real. They encourage us to forget God and what he said so we fall in fear. But if we are committed to Jesus Christ and our lives given to him, we must ensure that we do not forget the power of his word. What does God say when we first give ourselves to him? We grow very wise when we remember his word. Jesus Christ is real, and I encourage you to come to him today. He said, if you come to me, I will give you rest. I will give you help. He said, my burden is light and my ways are easy. What he means to say is that his power, his Holy Spirit will come upon you and help you to grow and help you to know God. Come to Jesus today and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you. I believe you died on the cross and rose again and I need you today. In Jesus name, amen.